I had an experience which really made me not want to, you know, really go into the realm of secular music anyways anymore. I had to perform with, uh, with, with uh, a well-known rapper and when we were performing, you know, after I, I was the first, you know, got up, did my thing or whatever, get back down, then it was his turn to get up. And when he got up, um, the it was like a voice came to me and was like, go to the back. I, I sat back there and I began to watch as the voice was instructing me to do. And as I started to watch, he started rapping. And as he started rapping, I saw shadows, like dark shadows coming out of his mouth and going uh, into the people to the women and to the men. I started noticing the women getting more like seductive and promiscuous. And then the guys started getting more rowdy and violent. And next thing you know, gun shots started happening in the club. This is what you want me to see. And a voice from heaven said this and, I, and I'll and i never forget it because that's what really made me was like, I can't do this anymore. Uh, he said, the same spirits that torment you are you making music is the same spirits that will torment others when they listen to it. And from that day forward, I was just like, I cannot lead a generation down the wrong path. Anything that we're doing contrary to God, we already know there's a spirit behind it because that spirit will say, use anything it can to have a door open into somebody's life. And music is one of the most powerful vehicles that a lot of people don't realize that you can't, you, you gonna have to literally guard your ear gates and your soul So today we have a man, Anthony Stanley, that'll be joining us today to share his testimony on the day. Uh, Brother Anthony, I thank you for coming on our platform today to share your testimony and letting people know what it is that God has done for you in your life. I uh, got a chance to kind of look at some of your other interviews and um, what God has brought you from and things that he's done for you in your life. Thank you for being on the platform today. Yes, sir. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be able to share my testimony on here. So yes, sir. I appreciate you. Yes, sir. Let me ask you this. Why do you think it's important to share your testimony today? Um, the Bible lets us know that we overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. And so basically, whenever we share our testimony, we overcome the enemy or we, we empower other people to overcome the enemy as well. So I believe that's why it's so important for when God deliver us or God blesses us that we uh, begin to share with everyone that we know that God is who he say he is. And when we do that, it gives them the faith to believe him to do it for them. And that's when we start seeing a, a wildfire of deliverance and breakthrough and blessings uh, for those who start believing in Christ again. Absolutely. How do you think your personal testimony will help somebody from the things that God has taken you through? Um, because it's common. Um, after I've been able to share my testimony um, on a few platforms, it gave me uh, pretty much a scope of view of so many uh, people who've been in the rap industry or been in the secular industry doing music or they've had encounters with, with God or they've seen spirits and all these things that um, I've experienced in my life or dealt with fornication or lust or pornography, things of that nature. When I was able to share that, it just looked like a influx of people just kept coming back to back saying, man, that's my story. That's my story. Or I grew up in church too, but I didn't know Christ, like all of these things. And so with me sharing my testimony has helped so many people who felt like this is a never ending cycle. I can't get out, been able to get out. You know, I've been able to pray with people, share things with them personally and minister to them that has, you know, just proven results of God is Jesus is who he say he is and has been delivering people and myself is included. So that's why um, I'm grateful that my testimony has been so impactful. Amen. Amen. So starting from the beginning, you were born in, I think you said Decatur, Illinois? Yes, sir. I was born and raised in uh, Decatur, Illinois. It's about three and a half hours away from Chicago. Some people will consider it to be a small town, <laughs> but I look at it to kind of be like, you know, a, a, um, a medium-sized town. It's not a lot going on, but you know, you can get by, you know, you got quite a few, you know, high schools and um, you got a community college and a lot of businesses that people open and just things you grow up to and you become accustomed to. And so, um, yes, I grew up there. Um, my mom and dad 
uh, where um, before I was conceived, my mom and dad was not married. Um, but when I was about two um, or three years old, my mom and dad got married. And then about two and a half years later, they were divorced. Um, and so I experienced, you know, the family dynamic, losing your dad, seeing the sheriff take him out. And so it affected me. Um, I felt like, man, like, what am I going to do without, you know, having a father um, in my life? And it had uh, played a major role, but I didn't utilize that as like an excuse to to say this is the reason why I'm bad or this is the reason why I had hardships because he wasn't there. So I always told myself I didn't want to be like a statistic, uh, someone who didn't have a dad and, and make, you know, and use that as a as an avenue to to say I can't make it or I can't do anything. But I will say that it did affect me where I ran to, uh, even though I grew up in church, my mom was raising me in church. She prayed over me. She did all these things. Um, I gravitated to secular rap music because um, I did not have my dad in my life. And I felt like that was a replacement um, because it, it gave me a sense of hope. It gave me a sense of inspiration. It gave me a sense of knowing that I can be something, I can do something. Um, I wanted to be noticed. I wanted to have that fame and I wanted to have money so I could supply for me and my mom and and be able to give her the things that she really worked hard for, but that she don't have to work hard anymore. And I just pay for everything for her. And so um, that was my goal. Um, but, you know, throughout my life, I've, I encountered, you know, a lot of the things like we like to call today generational curses, uh, you know, through the, I, I've never drank alcohol, but I've seen alcoholism. Um, but I partake in fornication um, and having secret sins such as a pornography issue and all these other things. So that right there was my crutch. Um, and rap music just fueled that lust that was on the inside of me because when you were, when I had opportunities to open up for major artists and things like that, I had, I was exposed to a lot of women and women was excited, you know, around those times and still to say how they get excited about, you know, musicians or, or people that look like they're going somewhere or they're doing something. I just was, it was just easy access to operate in that sinful nature that I was in. Um, and I believe that God would the whole time was working on me and did not allow myself to go so far into it to where there was no way of pulling me out of it. Um, he kept putting in my heart that there was something different. And I, and I knew uh, that it was different when I had a meeting uh, with a record label um, called Switcher House Records. Um, I was able to meet with uh, Jay Prince's son, uh, one time and we all, you know, got a chance to chat after he seen me perform in Vegas one time and I got a chance to sit with him and we were able to kind of go over some of my music and talk about some things. And then I've heard, uh, then, then after, you know, I got a chance to, um, I got a chance to, uh, freestyle. And then again, they heard some more of my music and they was like, yeah, we want to sign you. However, uh, you're too soft or your music is not gangster enough. And when that happened to me, um, I made it a conscious decision in my mind that this is not what I'm supposed to be doing if I can't be myself. So I know a lot of people was like, man, you know, you're crazy. Why do you didn't sign? Why you didn't do these things? Uh, why you just didn't change up your music just so that you could be on and you could switch it up once you got on? Like all those thoughts uh, came to me after the fact, but in the heat of the moment, I said, I can't do this. I want I want to be me, and if I'm not going to be signed for me being me, um, I'm not into the you know the derogatory music or being gangster or showing a side of me that that's not even part of my lifestyle. I've been around it, but I never partook in selling drugs or being in the hood and things of that nature. So I, right. I didn't I didn't want to be fake. So um, you know they told you me. Know, can, I, can I ask you this? Yes, sir. Uh, when, when did your musical journey start? My musical journey started when, um, again, when I was like five, it started actually in church. Um, I was actually singing uh, in the choirs um, and leading songs and things of, things of that nature. So it started in church. Um, my, my, my dad was an a, a R&B artist, so he wrote a lot of R&B music and recorded. Um, I have a bunch of uncles and cousins who, um, you know, did rap music and stuff. So I was around it all the time. Um, and so with me being around it, I just grew to love it and I started writing it. Wow. 
So it's pretty much kind of true that a lot of your R&B, hip hop, all these different genres of music, they really start with gospel music, pretty much. Pretty much, yeah. But I, I never, you know, I never thought that, again, like me singing, you know, in the choir and doing that, to me, it was just like something I felt like I was being forced to do because uh, my mom, she really wanted me in church and stuff. And that church that I was a part of was very heavy on youth. So they pushed the youth to do stuff or we had youth programs and stuff. So I was pretty much felt like I was made to be a part of it. My mom would get mad at me if I didn't go or do something. So um, but I still at the same time, while I was singing and doing these things like I had moments where I felt God's presence and I I didn't know what I was feeling at the time. You know what I mean? I didn't know it was Holy Spirit, you know, when I would, well, I would cry, I would weep and, and feel this, un, and this unexplainable joy. You know what I mean? Like, I didn't know I was experiencing the Holy Spirit and his power at that time. I just thought, you know, just doing normal church jargon stuff. And so again, as I grew older, I'm like, well, I can make, my mom didn't make me or force me to do stuff. So that's when I started pursuing the rap music at its fullness and when I was like 13. Okay. And you eventually got a record deal? I was close to getting one. I never got one. Um, when I was 16, I was recording. I started recording with my uncle in, and uh, he lived in Colorado. Uh, I started recording with him and his he didn't have a record label, but he had a publishing company called Nat Natia Publishing. And so I made my first, like, for real album. Like, I always made music and just recorded, but I made my first, like, for real album with him. And, uh, you know, they put it all out. They made those beats and stuff like that. And again, I'm just experimenting because this is my first time really ever recording or doing anything. So this was all new to me. And when I go back and listen to it, I'm like, oh, man, I had some learning to do at that time. But, uh, but, I never had a full on fledged record deal. I always had opportunities to open up and do stuff like that. But I had that opportunity that I didn't take. So I didn't take the record deal when they told me I needed to change. I needed to be gangster. Okay. And like, what, 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 what did life lead you from that point? So when I declined there, of course, like anybody else, man, when you feel like, man, I'm this close to a dream, and this is what I always wanted to do. You know, I always wanted to be this rapper. I wanted to be famous. I wanted to have money. And I'm right there to get ready to sign something. Um, I was depressed. Um, I actually stopped making music. Uh, it was about a year or two years before I started making music again. But I just was like, I can't do this. And like, I don't even want to do this anymore. Like, if this, if it's, if the music industry is this fake, then what I'm, what I'm going to do? Because at the time, like, I wasn't big, like, on social media. Um, I didn't I, like the family I grew around was kind of like limited when it came to entrepreneurship or things that know the next best thing is happening. So I wasn't never really around like smart minds like that, that would help me, you know, be a capture thing. So I didn't know that like I was huge on my space, but I didn't know YouTube was going to become what it was become. And I didn't know streaming was going to become what it became in the time where I was making music. So. I was just like, man, if I don't get a deal, then this is never going to work for me because I didn't know, you know, I didn't know independent artists can make it like that. Um, Cause I was, again, I didn't have no knowledge of that kind of stuff. So I just kind of stopped. And then um, I went to college. I went to the Illinois Institute of Art in Schaumburg, Illinois. And I started uh, studying audio production, which I knew how to do all of that stuff, engineering and working on Pro Tools, Logic and making beats and writing and all these things. I knew all, pretty much everything that was there. I just wanted to get the credentials behind it and get some more connections. And when I got there, I did. I established a lot of connections with producers and stuff like that. And one producer in particular, um, shout out to EB. His name is EB. I connected with him and uh, and while we were there together and that's when I started working on this album that I felt like, man, this one was going to be for real. Like this one, if I wasn't going to get no recognition, this one was going to get that recognition. Um, and I started working on an a, a EP with him called Different State of Mind. And this was, this was, it was working out really good. Um, but while I was there again, I started, you know, I was recording a lot, um, but I had this lust issue. And it got so bad to where, like, I had a different girl, like, pretty much every night. And it, it got so bad to where I just, 
I had to go into a prayer closet and I called it a prayer closet because it was really big. And I went in there and I prayed for, for a long time from like 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. I said, Lord, um, if you are real and you say that you are like, I can't continue to live like this. Sleeping with these women and stuff is making me feel empty on the inside. I don't feel whole. I'm not happy. Even though I'm doing this music stuff, I'm not happy. Something doesn't feel right. I don't feel like I'm in my purpose. I'm like, Lord, if you are real and you say that this is who you are in my life, then I need you to show yourself to me. So as I begin to pray, nothing happened. I'm just crying and praying and crying and praying and crying and praying. And no powerful stuff happened in that closet. It wasn't until I got out of the closet and I started to sweep and clean that a thought came to me and was like, well, maybe he maybe he's not real. Maybe you just continue doing what you're doing. But I rejected that thought. And I'm like, no, nah, I know the Lord is real because while I was in there, I was pouring out my heart. I didn't want to be the same person anymore. And I knew something that clicked. And right when I was getting ready to walk into the bathroom to clean it, because I was just sweeping up some stuff. Next thing I know, I fall face first to the ground. It was like the mighty Russian wind, like the book of Acts chapter two, where the Holy Spirit comes in and knocks me on the ground. And for the first time ever in my life, I'm filled with the Holy Spirit and I'm speaking in a heavenly language that I know nothing about. And um, it was so powerful. Like uh, then a cloud appeared before me and the Lord began to speak out of it and say, Anthony, I called you to be a prophet to this nation. Um, I'm going to use you. Um, you're going to master the prophetic. Um, I want you to go back home. I'm going to raise you up to be a, a worship leader. I'm going to give you a new sound. And he was just sharing with me a lot of things like in my heart. Like there's some things that he shared with me that was personal um, and that I you know, didn't get a chance to share while I was on the other platforms, which I don't feel led to share now. But those were little things that he was sharing with me. But the main thing that stuck out was to go back home. And when he said that to me, I heard him and I'm crying and I get up and I call my mom and say, mom, I had this encounter with Jesus. He showed up. He came into my my apartment and man, I know he's real now and all of these things. And she's crying. She's like, I was just at church. I was praying for you and all of that. Um, I allowed myself to um, like anybody else would do when you have an encounter like that or experience like that. Sometimes you question yourself and thinking that's like maybe maybe I'm going crazy or something. Maybe this is, wasn't real. But I knew it was real because something on the inside of me was different. But I was just like, if I leave now and I go back home and I start reasoning with myself, like everybody going to think I'm a failure. Like, why, why would I go home? I don't even got this degree. I didn't get this degree. Like, why would I do that? And I start questioning myself and questioning what he was telling me, which I just had this whole powerful encounter, but yet I'm still questioning. And um, so I was like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to go home. But I called EB and I'm like, look, man, let's finish up this album. He was like, look, I'm going to go home too. So let's get back. I'm, you can go with me to uh, St. Louis and we can go there and record and we can finish up your album. I'll say, but look, this is what I'm going to do. Because <laughs> now I've been changed. I, I feel something different on the inside of me. So I'm like, look, I can't continue doing the same kind of music. This music has to be more positive, all right? So when we go, we got to make more positive music. And surely God's not going to be mad at me for making some more positive music. So we got, uh, <laughs> so we packed up everything. We began to go. And uh, when the first night we get there, uh, I, you know, we pull up into the studio and stuff. I record this song that we was working on. Um, I have my bags and stuff still in the car because we never really kind of got settled nowhere where we were staying. We just went straight to the studio because it didn't take too long to get from there to St. Louis. So um, that night when we got, uh, we went, got in the car, we was going to go get something to eat, but all my stuff was still in the car. We pull up to this red light and I'll never forget it. Right when we got there, the car stops and immediately we start smelling smoke and seeing smoke rise up from the back seat where I was sitting at me. And it was another guy there. And then there was another guy in the front. Then it was EB who was driving. And uh, we start panicking, you know, trying to hurry up and open the door. And I'm like the last person to get out. And the moment my feet touch the ground, fire just shoots up from the back seat and it burns the whole car up. And everything I had with me, like they didn't have nothing. Everything I had with me, my phone, my jewelry, my money, my, my, all of my uh, clothes, my nice clothes I had, my, um, my, my Bible. I even had my Bible. I, everything I had with me burnt up in that fight. And right then and there, 
the voice of the Lord came to me again and said, Anthony, I told you to go home. I told you I called you to be like the rehearsed word. I told you to be, uh, I called you to be a prophet of nations. I told you I'm gonna raise you up to be a worship leader. Go back home. And like, they just kept coming to me and I start crying and bawling, man. And they like, they looking at me like I'm crazy, but they didn't know like the Lord is speaking to me and telling me like, you just, you just disobeyed me. I told you to go home, but you're trying to do something else and go home. So I had no other choice but to go home. That was like a Jonah experience. I had no other choice. So um, I call my mom, my mom picks me up and I go to church because uh, that it was a Saturday that she came and got me. It was a Saturday night. We got got back home to her house. And um, that next morning was church. And of course, anybody stay at my mama's house, you've got to go to church on Sunday morning regardless. So I didn't have anything. I didn't have no clothes, nothing. I just went with some sweatpants and a T-shirt, everything I had on me that same day. And man, my pastor preached and he preached a whole message about my life. It was like the Holy Spirit was just speaking through him. And that's when um, the prophecy was fulfilled. After he, um, you know, preached this message, he asked me to come up and sing. And I sung. And man, the presence of God was in there. And um, at the end of service, he called me over to him and he said, the Lord spoke to me and told me to make you the worship leader over our ministry. And the rest was history. God started doing a quick work. I started learning um, the, um, you know, the prophetic. Uh, he started giving me songs. He started opening my ears to hear different sounds in heaven. And it just, it just, everything changed. And I was a whole nother person from there. Wow. So like God is using you with music. What point do you get to when you experience like how spirits can move on people when it comes to the wrong kind of music? So um, when I had, when, when God started working on me with that, prior to that though, because I'm kind of like, it's, it's a lot of stuff that, that happened that I'm trying to like condense. It's just so much. But prior to that though, I had an experience which really made me not want to, you know, really go into the realm of secular music anyways anymore. Um, prior to all of that and the record deal, when that got shut down, I had to uh, go to, um, I forgot where we was at. We was either in Champaign, Illinois, or in uh, like, either it was Champaign or Chicago, but it was still in Illinois somewhere, but where, I had to perform with uh, with, with uh, a well-known rapper. And when we were performing, you know, after I, I was the first, you know, got up, did my thing or whatever, get back down, then it was his turn to get up. And when he got up, um, the it was like a voice came to me and was like, go to the back of the club, because we was in this club. And I, I went to the back of the club. I, I sat back there and I began to watch as the voice was instructing me to do. And as I started to watch, he started rapping. And as he started rapping, I saw shadows, like dark shadows coming out of his mouth and going uh, into the people, to the women and to the men. I started noticing the women getting more like seductive and promiscuous. And then the guys started getting more rowdy and violent. And next thing you know, gunshots started happening in the club. And I run out and I go to my car and I'm just crying. And I'm like, this is what you want me to see. And a voice from heaven said this, and, I, and I'll never forget it because that's what really made me was like, I can't do this anymore. Uh, he said, the same spirits that torment you while you make your music is the same spirits that will torment others when they listen to it. And from that day forward, I was just like, I cannot lead a generation down the wrong path. And it just messed me up because it's like, we don't realize that when we're making secular music, if it doesn't start from God, like any kind of music, if it doesn't originate from God, then the originator had to be either a demonic spirit influencing you or influencing that sound or self or flesh. And most of the time it's a demonic spirit because any spirit or any kind of sound or music you make that has lust in it, violence, 
perversion, anything contrary to the fruit of the spirit, the things that God tell us we should have, but or the things that he tell us not to do, but yet we're putting it on our music saying that it's okay to do. Anything that we're doing contrary to God, we already know there's a spirit behind it because that spirit will say, use anything it can to have a door open into somebody's life. And music is one of the most powerful vehicles that a lot of people don't realize that you can't, you, you going to have to literally guard your ear gates and your soul powerful. Um, from allowing those things to come in because we have to literally be watchmen over our soul, over our, our, over our ear gates and our eye gates because the enemy will find a way to get in. And then you start realizing that one day you like, I'm living good. I'm fine. I ain't thinking about lust. I'm not thinking about violence. I'm not thinking about none of this stuff. And all it takes is the one song to just start popping up in your spirit. And now you're like, oh, let me call this person or let me go this route. Or, oh, I'm angry today. I'm ready to I'm ready to hurt somebody. I'm ready to do this. Things that you wasn't feeling, you start feeling when these when this music start coming on. And I noticed that's that. True. I'm like, oh, OK. Now that's that's why when people want to get in the mood, they start playing some R and B music. Or when they when when they're when I see a lot of you know my friends and family. I remember I had an uncle that used to listen to Tupac all the time, and he was like straight yeah. up gangster and thug. And he always say, anytime I hear Hail Mary, I'm ready to I'm ready to hurt somebody for real. I'm ready to shoot somebody. You know Can what I mean? Say like, something? That's how real it is. Uh, not to cut you off, just to add to what you're saying. I interviewed a young man. Uh, he's an ex crip but uh, God delivered him and saved him, um, changed his life around. But what's ironic to add to what you're saying, he said that when him and his um, friends would go to do break-ins and robberies and things like that, he said they would just sit in the car, no, didn't need any weed, no uh, alcohol, they would just sit in the car and listen to Lil Wayne and that would give them the energy to do what they needed to do, whether that was uh, uh, kicking in doors, robberies, that gave them the motivation to do that. It's by that music. So that's that's crazy how that works. Music is so powerful and it has such an influence, just like you're saying, it gives you that energy, and but which, but what you're telling us, and I need everybody that's watching. I need you to share, like, and share to somebody uh, that thinks they can be a Christian and still listen to all this secular music, and, and don't think that nothing is going to influence you, motivate you, or tempt you. But what you're saying is, you actually saw spiritually what happens when this kind of music is being played. Yep. My eyes, you know, and again, I try not to sound like really deep, but it's what happened, you know, and, uh, and sharing my testimony on several platforms, you know, you get a lot of the naysayers who oh, this he he was on shrooms or he was on drugs or he was doing this. And let me make this disclaimer again that I've said several times. I've never drank alcohol a day in my life and I never done any drugs a day in my life. I have families that's alcoholics and I have family members that are drug addicts. I did not want to go down that path. The only issue I had that God had to fully deliver me from was lust and perversion. So let me throw that out there. So I wasn't high. I wasn't drunk. I wasn't off no pills. I wasn't off of shrooms. I wasn't off of anything. God opened my eyes to the spirit world to show me this is what was going on. It shocked me. It blew my mind because I've never experienced stuff like that. Um, and because, again, you got to remember, I wasn't 100 percent saved. I went to church. But I didn't, I wasn't converted. You know what I mean? I, I was just like Peter. You know how Peter in the Bible where Jesus anointed him and he was casting out demons. He was doing all this stuff. And then Jesus asked who to, uh, all his disciples, and who do you say that I am? And everyone else is saying, you are Elias and you are this and you're that. And then Peter, uh, you are the you are the son of the living God. You are the Messiah. And Jesus said, you know, flesh and blood did not reveal that to you, Peter. But my father in heaven, the Holy Spirit revealed that to you. That's the only way you would have known that. And on, on that rock, I'm going to build my church. And Peter, the same person that said all of this stuff is the same person that said, I don't even know him when the pressure came. And the thing that stuck out to me the most is when Jesus told him, when you, he told him, Peter, Satan desires to sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith will not fail you. But this was the most powerful part. He said, when you are converted, Go and strengthen your brothers. And that stuck with me because Peter, the whole time, 
believed, walked, and did the stuff, but he was never converted in his heart. And I was the second. That's good. Say that again, if you don't mind. Peter was, Peter walked, did the works, prayed, cast out demons, did it all, but was never converted in his heart. And I would say I was the exact same way. I went to church. I sung in the choir. You know, I did all that stuff. I served. I did all of that, but I was never converted in my heart to really make Jesus Christ my Lord and Savior until I had that encounter with him. And so I didn't really understand when he talked to me and did these things. So all of this stuff was new to me. And so when I seen those those spirits come out of that rapper's mouth, it, it, it just blew me away because that's when I knew how serious it was. Uh, I'll never forget, uh, it was when I have gotten converted and stuff and I gave my life to Christ, I kept having numerous visions and I would literally be laying in bed and just get taken into a whole vision. And I got taken into a vision where I, I uh, was sitting in a chair and I, and I had a, um, like a phone in my hand. And this phone was weird because it wasn't connected to anything. It wasn't connected to a line. It wasn't connected to nothing. And this phone just started ringing in my hand. And it wasn't a cell phone. <laughs> it just, it didn't have nothing on it. It just, it's just little hand, like one of those, um, corded kind of hand thing, but it didn't have a cord or nothing. It just started ringing. So I answer it. And on the other end, it's, uh, it's T.I. And T.I. is saying, I need your help. I need you to come and, and rescue me and to pray for me and to help me. And I'm like, where are you? Where, where do you need to go? And he told me where he was at, you know, and that, it's like he started giving me directions to this place. And so I go to this place and I literally see him in this room in chains like locked up in this prison. And I'm like trying to figure out what this thing is. I'm like, man, how you end up here? How did you end up in here? And in the vision, uh, the only way for those chains to come off is when I started praying for him and I had this, and for some reason I had this uh, like briefcase with me and it was full of oil, like anointing oil. Like, and I knew which one to grab and I grabbed one and I put my hand on him and all of those chains and those things fell off. And when I came up out of the vision, I asked the Lord, I said, Lord, what was this meaning? Because I've never spoken with T.I. I never opened for him. I, I don't know, have no relationship, no connection with him whatsoever. And the Lord shared with me, he said that I've allowed you to experience what it was like to be in you know, that type of field, that kind of, you know, industry, you know, you was rapping, you were performing with them on some of the same stages as some of these people, but you was may have never had a relationship with them. But this is the reality of the lifestyle that they live in. And the reality is that the enemy had them in a bondage, in a chain. And the only way for them to get out is that they're going to have to be broken free by the anointing from God. The Bible says that the anointing destroys yokes and lifts every heavy burden. So by the anointing of God, is the only way that somebody chains and yokes and will be destroyed. And so God told me that I have to be, he said, you have to remain anointed because when I place you in, um, you know, in front of these people or people who are bound just like them, that oil is going to be able to set them free. And so that's why it was always a charge for me to live pure. So I had several visions of celebrities, like I can name them, bro. Nicki Minaj to Beyonce to Rihanna to all these people. I seen Jay Z in a in a in a in a most craziest vision that I've ever had. But the Lord literally showing me, you know, the reality of this uh, of the secular world of music and stuff, and the spirits that is behind it. Like like literally, Jay Z, the spirit that's within Jay Z is to take over the world. Like it's an antichrist spirit that is within him, you know, not to speak ill or down against him or anything like that, but just to tell the truth of the spirit that's behind him. The Lord showed me that I literally seen this spirit through him standing on a massive platform pointing to the world, uh, planning takeover. And, and it was crazy because when I seen that, that was like two years before uh, he actually came out with uh, you know, uh, that song with uh, Rihanna where he said, uh, uh, you know, run this town or whatever like that. And and I think within that song, he said, life begins when the church ends. And, I, and I'll and i never forget, never forget that. Because I was like, I just had all of these visions. Like God was really, I'm telling you, man, he was showing me so many visions. Like I thought I was crazy because, it, but the more time you spend with God, the more of his mind is revealed to you. 
So that's when I started going all in with being in his presence. You know what I mean? It wasn't just one happenstance I spent, you know, from 9, you know, a.m. to 9 p.m. or 9 p.m. to 9 a.m. Like these times, like I spent countless hours with God and he showed me all kinds of stuff. Jesus began to reveal things to me that, you know, that's what we're seeing today is things that I've already seen and, 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 and he's been showing me. I have it written down. My wife even knows um, but you know, it's not my place to go on and social media and, and to share all these prophecies to be known and all this other stuff. That's not my place. My place is to know what he's giving me so I can prepare the people that he puts in my life and the, in the, the sphere of influence he's given me to be able to share with those that, you know, he has ordained to hear that message. And, you know what I mean? And, and, and God is, you know, wanting us as the people of God to wake up because he want to show us what's really going on in this, in this Amen. time. And you said something very profound. The only way God used you as it pertained to visions and dreams and him revealing his mind to you, you said something very important. You said you had to maintain a pure, holy lifestyle. Is yes, sir. Right? Yes, sir. Kind of walk me through that because we, uh, 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 everybody like and share because I would believe that we have a lot of gifted people. We have, uh, because my audience is, of course, is catered to, you know, the church and um, fellow believers of Christ all over the world. And we have a lot of gifted people, uh, especially young people, um, anointed, but Tell us what does it, how do we maintain that? Just what you said, how do we maintain the anointing of God in our life from your experience? It's it's a really a simple, it's it's a simple, uh it's a simple walk, really. It's not really hard, but it's only become hard is because our flesh fight against it and our will have not conformed to his. And so what it is is really when I started learning. Um, who Christ was, that's when I understood the importance of purity. Christ used to say several times that he was doing his father's will or his food was to do the will of the father or I only do what my father in heaven sent me. That's the strategy right there. Like David, when David lived his life, you know how serious he was to be pure after his big fall that he had was that he brought the Ark of the Covenant into his bedroom he did not want to be far away from God anymore. He didn't want to make a mistake that he brought it into a place that he had sin in. Remember, he slept with somebody's wife and then he got the man killed and like, you know, sexual aversion was his thing. So he brought God into that place. And that's how you remain pure. That's how you remain. The struggle that you have, you bring God into that place. The struggle I had, I brought God in. So at nighttime, on the moments where I will feel myself, you know, where the enemy would say, hey, pick up that phone, call this girl or call this person. I will bring God into that time and I will I will take that moment and I will force my flesh to pray. I will force myself to spend time in his presence. And That's good. The, moment, the moment I kept forcing it on those moments where I'm at my peak was the moments where I felt breakthrough and that. Now it became a habit of lifestyle. And so I'm more like, and I'm be honest with you, living a pure life is actually not a popular life either. Because when you live a pure life, you intimidate people who don't live right. And I don't know why. It's like Ooh, that. Say, say, that, say that again. Say that again. That's going to bless somebody. Say that again. I'm so serious, man. When you live a pure life, you intimidate those who don't live right for the Lord. I have always, my whole life, and I'm not, this is not a bragging, this is not nothing. You could try, try my spirit. Literally, people will tell my wife, they will call and talk to her, but say, I don't want to talk to Anthony. Or they say, I don't want to talk to Apostle Man because, you know, he's serious, man. He for real. Like, I, it's something about him, man. It just makes me want to get right. Like, I have countless of people, when they call me, they just start crying. Because like the real lifestyle, like this real to me, like I spend time with God. I don't, I try to have to open up doors and portals to where the enemy can come into my life. Like I realized the seriousness because it was that purity that I possessed that set so many people free. I done seen so many miracles. 
I done seen so many deliverances. I done seen things that would be hard for others to do become easy because of my, my status, my relationship with God. Am I perfect? Nope. But I realized that when I am in a moment and I find a weakness, I find strength in his presence. And we mm-hmm. just got to just be honest. How bad do we want to live for Christ? That's good. You know, our will, we have to will. And I said it on other platforms and I say it here, we have to will to live for him. The most powerful thing you have is more powerful than 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 casting out devils, than healing the sick, than all of that is your will. And then once you learn how to subject that will to his, that right there is the key to living pure. And I believe that Christ even told us, like he told the lady that has seven demons, and I think it was Mary Magdalene, he cast out seven demons out of her, and he told her to go and sin no more. Every person he healed, he said, go and sin no more. And I always had a question like, why would Jesus tell somebody go and sin no more with theology, with theologians and everybody say that we're going to sin every day. We're all are not perfect. And we, you know, they use that as I think, believe we use all of that stuff as excuses to live anywhere we want to live. But if Jesus clearly tell a person go and sin no more, I believe we have the ability through our will. If we decide to say, I'm going to live under the will of God to say, I am not going to live my life focused on sin every day, living in sin every day. Every day I got to fall short. Every day I got to do this. No, you don't have to. You you have to will to do this thing. Let me give you this last thing, and, I, and I'm going to leave this subject alone. Go for if it. If you ever study Smith Wigglesworth, when I learned and studied Smith Wigglesworth, you look him up, he was a very powerful man of God. He was considered now a, a general of faith. But Smith right. Wigglesworth, when he did not even allow secular anything to come to his house. Like they had, at the time, they didn't have the TVs. They had newspapers. So I remember Lester Summerall, one of the, another powerful man of God, one of the faith generals, tried, was, was you know, speaking with him and came to his house and brought a newspaper. And Smith Wigglesworth told him, I don't want that in my house. You got to leave that out there. And when they got together, the only thing they did was sat in that living room and they would read and pray, read and pray. Lester wasn't used to something like that. He was like, this man has lost his mind. He crazy. But his only desire was to be in the presence of the Lord. He read and prayed. That was his entertainment. You know, nowadays, we got to watch all kind of secular movies. We got to do all kind of secular things. If we don't get that in our life, we are unhappy. But man, we haven't grown to be content with just God himself. And that's where that purity lies within the presence of God himself. And we got to be able to give up everything else. Amen. Amen. That is so powerful. I I wish, um, I really hope that a lot of people take that away. I personally, uh, that's going to be something that I really hold on to because even us as ministers, we have to be reminded that's what it takes to maintain what God has given us. You know, Uh, it's not all about how many scriptures, you know, it's not about how well you can preach, but it's maintaining a life of holiness, a life of righteousness. You know, he said the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but it's righteousness, Righteousness. peace, joy, and the Holy Ghost. So that is so uh, ever important. And then he said this, follow peace with all men for holiness without which no man can see the Lord. So I appreciate and I honor that uh, from a fellow brother in Christ um, that's that speaks the same words when it comes to, you know, uh, living a life of purity and holiness because we can't operate of our own self or our own strength or merit, but it's by the grace of God that he allows us to do anything that we do for his kingdom. So we appreciate that. And um, I hope everybody that's watching really take away what uh, 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 Pastor Anthony is teaching us on today when it comes to um, living a life of holiness, staying away from carnal things that can contaminate your spirit. And so a lot of things, what you said is really going to be a blessing. I thank you so much for coming on the platform to be a blessing and share your testimony, what God has done for you. Cause one thing you, we can debate stories, we can debate opinions, but you cannot debate a per a person's personal experience. That's something that you can't take away. 
So if you don't mind, man of God, if you don't mind, pray for everybody that's watching as we conclude and go out. Yes, sir. So again, I, I want to thank God. I want to thank this, uh, this, you know, thank you for this opportunity to be able to share the testimony, be able to share what's on my heart and what the Lord will wants the people who will listen to this to know. But I want to give you this before I pray. You know, those of you that may be watching that do not know Jesus Christ, maybe you've been straddling the fence. Maybe you're like, yeah, look, I really want to know. I want to try, but the church people getting on my nerves or it's just been tough for me. I don't know how I can get out of this situation. Well, I kind of let you know that no matter other ways that you may try, you know, other gods you might try to look up to, um, you might be trying to get into operating witchcraft, the new age, you know, black power and all these other things that the, the enemy will want you to get to distort the real power and the real true power can only come through Jesus Christ. If you go through the other door, it's a counterfeit door. The only true way to heaven is through Jesus. And I want you to make that decision right now. All right. It wasn't until I gave my life to Christ. It wasn't until he showed up to me. He may not show up to you like he did with me. He may not come as a as a as a as a cloud and, and speak to you so dramatically like it happened to me. It may not happen like that for you. But at the end of the day, these same words I'm speaking right now and everything you've heard in this testimony have been penetrating your heart. It's been penetrating your spirit. You're like, man, I got to get right. I know I need to make a change. That's him speaking to you just as powerful as it was when I had my encounter. But you can make that decision right now to receive Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. Jesus is the only way. And I want to make sure I get that in your spirit. So let me go ahead and make um, pray for you. Father, right now in the mighty name of Jesus, thank you for this testimony. Thank you for this time. Thank you for this platform. And I pray that you will begin to deliver your people. I pray that you'll begin to touch your people. Those that's been going through hardship, that's going through struggles, that have addictions, that have addictions of drugs, alcohol, lust, perversions of all kind. Maybe they're angry. Maybe they have bitterness. Maybe they have grief. I've experienced loss in my life. I lost my mother. God, maybe they have grief. God, maybe they're experiencing um, all kind of mental torment. Father, today, right now, under this anointing, under this moment right now, your power, your blood, your anointing that destroys yokes can set them free right now. God, if there's rappers that's watching this, those that's in secular rap, secular artists, in, in secular culture, secular world that's in change, that's in this bondage that I've seen, even when that, that vision I shared about, God, through the anointing, even in that vision, God, you were able to set that person free. So I declare that you will set whoever is watching right now free by the anointing. You said it destroys yokes and it lifts heavy burdens. So I decree and declare that this anointing will begin to touch right now. Set them free that every demonic assignment that has been set and placed against them now we begin to call it canceled and we declare that they are blessed and they become highly favored. Those that don't know you, Father, I pray that they will make a decision in their heart to receive you as their personal Lord and Savior and that they don't stop there with the confession. But God, you will show them how to live the life effectively and that they will become a disciple and they will pick up their cross and follow you for the rest of their, their days. I thank you right now. I give you the glory. I give you the honor. I bless you and I pray that you will bless this platform to reach more people for, for the kingdom of God and more souls will come into the kingdom. We give you praise, glory, and honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Ladies and gentlemen, we've had Brother Anthony Stanley to come on and give his testimony. Man of God, uh, are you, uh, do you have anything like uh, social media handles? Anybody can follow you or any books or anything that you want to let anybody know that you can? Yes, sir. Like, so, yes. Yeah, so they can um, go to www.ram and it's R-E-A-L-M dot, uh, I'm sorry, www.realm.com. GI.com. So www.ramgi.com. And you can go on, you can follow, you can, um, you know, see what we're doing. Um, I have a new book that I just released, and this is why I'm pushing Jesus Christ. This is why I'm pushing, um, you know, giving our hearts to Jesus, because I actually wrote a book um, called Jesus Revealed, Reintroducing the Jesus of the Bible. Um, and it's a very powerful book. You can get it on Amazon as well, um, but you can get it from the website. Um, you can follow me on um, YouTube, Anthony Stanley Official. 
as well as on uh, Instagram, Anthony Stanley Official, or you can look up on Facebook, um, Apostle Anthony Stanley, and you can follow me there. You can reach out to us. We're here to pray for you. Again, I have several people that have reached out to me that I was able to pray with, uh, be able to minister to, um, and that's just where God have us. And so again, I, I'm just, again, I'm grateful for this opportunity to be able to share, you know, my testimony. I don't say no opportunity lightly. Um, and so if you've been blessed, you know, just connect with me and uh, just follow the journey because, you know, it doesn't stop here. And Jesus Christ is going to do something very powerful in all of our lives. And we're going to see the kingdom of God revealed. So look forward to connecting with every single one of you. Amen. Well, thank you once again, man, of God, for coming on our platform. Uh, uh, I don't want this to be your last time. Hopefully, uh, you know, we see what God does for us, man. And hopefully uh, we can collaborate on a greater level you know, uh, Lois will in, um, in the coming days. So I really appreciate you taking out your time once again, coming on the platform and blessing, you know, uh, your testimony has already been a blessing, uh, just to the people that are in my circle, those that I'm around or what have you, um, you know, the Bible says when one soul is come back to Christ, the whole heaven rejoice. So, uh, I know we're in the time of views and numbers and things like that, but uh, as long as we're making a, at least an impact one by one, you know, we're um, daily, slowly dismantling the kingdom of darkness. So we yeah. appreciate that once again. Um, I thank you for your your collaboration and your patience. And um, until next time, God bless. Yes, sir. God bless you. Yes.